We've got a lot of ground to cover, man. A lot of ground to cover today. And I'm excited about it. A couple things before we, uh, before we jump in to the last chapter, I left off with a few things about last week that I didn't get to. Um, so just by way of review, you know how that is. You know, I just, just can't help myself. Just by way of review, uh, if, you, if you didn't have uh, from, from chapter 4, a few things. Verse 10, um, it, some of you, if you had the program, know this, that, and we're learning this together. You can go back on YouTube and download my sermon notes and go through that from the YouTube link. So we're trying, can you see what we're doing here? We're trying to push as much material in your hands as possible for your own Bible study, for you to dig into the Word of God. But uh, last week we talked about being armed in the Word of God. We talked about being alert in prayer. And we talked about being loving in our relationships. Do you all remember that? Uh, about being loving in our relationships. Well, there were two that I didn't get to. So I just want to mention them, and then we're going to jump into chapter 5. The two things, uh, being hospitable. If you look at chapter, if you're there in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, the Bible says, just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve, what does it say, if you have your Bibles? Others. Use it to serve others others as good stewards of the varied grace of God. Listen, we need to be hospitable in our stewardship. I just want to say this. The Lord didn't give you good gifts to sit on them. The Lord didn't give you good gifts to hoard them. The Lord gave you good gifts to use them. And uh, look, our church is a picture of this. Um, and, and I'm just, I'm so very thankful uh, for many of you. I mean, uh, Nick, Nick came and started playing bass and then more people started showing up right? Uh, hey, I have a friend that plays guitar. Marcus comes, he completes starting point uh, like last week, and he's right up here playing. You know what I mean? Uh, folks just jumping in. That, listen, that's what it's about. It's about using our gifts for the Lord and being good stewards. Some of y'all, I know it, you're sitting on gifts. You're sitting on abilities, and the Lord wants, wants us to use them. So if you go back and look at chapter 4, verse 10 shows us that. I'm not going to dig into it. I don't have time um, but I think it's worth the study looking at that word gifts. And if you have the program, look at my notes on 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 6.23. And there's a spirit involved there that will show you your gifts and yielding to him. And number five, uh, and this is important, verse 18 leading into this week's. Um, and if a righteous person is saved with difficulty, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Listen, we are going to suffer uh, in, in this Christian life. It's inevitable. And, and, and those that do not have the Lord, guess what? They're going to suffer too. Look around. Look around. The, the theme of this book, as we finish up First Peter, the theme is going through hard times. How many of you have experienced hard times? That's all of us. We've all walked through suffering. But here's what the Lord says. He says, listen, not only do you need to be hospitable in your stewardship, you need to be secure in your suffering. And here's what I'll say about that. The devil is going, and this, this goes into today, the devil is going to use uh, your sin and your past against you. He's going to use your sin and your past against you. How many know that's true, right? And, and we're going to deal with it intimately this morning in chapter 5, but I think it's important to understand that we need to be secure in our suffering. Why is that relevant? Because I think some of you are going and walking through difficult times and because you're still dabbling in sin a little bit, because you're still walking the line in the flesh, you have no context for whether or not it's what the Lord is leading you through or if it's a, a byproduct of your sin. So, so this morning what I want you to understand is that you are absolutely going through hard times. And, and, and here's the thing. Uh, we're not exempt. John 16, In the world, you will have persecution. We're going to go. You don't come in the church. If this is your first time here uh, and you're like, man, I just want to feel better. And then the pastor says, you're going to go through hard times. If you came here to church to, to escape hard times and to escape trials, you're in the wrong place. You're going to walk through hard times. But, but we can walk through those things securely in the Lord. Knowing that those things will not become lords over us, they will not condemn us, they will not control us. Listen, the Lord has already conquered the very thing that will kill you, and that's your sin. So therefore, we can live in victory in the suffering. Okay, so you need to be secure in the suffering. So if you don't feel secure 
and the hard time that you're walking through right now, then chances are, chances are we're not living the way that we should be living. Does that make sense? Now, let's go into chapter 5 today, and I'm going to talk fast, and we're going to get through this uh, quick, but the Lord's got some special things for us. Let's pray. While I pray, uh, you pray in your heart or out loud, I don't care. Uh, pray that the Lord's going to do something this morning through the Word. Father, I pray that you would continue to meet with us, uh, illuminate your Word through your Holy Spirit. Help me to say the things that I should say, and help me not to say the things that you don't want me to say. Father, we, we just submit to you completely and wholly. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, chapter five. I, I have a neat illustration for this morning, and I'm going to save it for the end, okay? I think it will resonate with you. I think it will uh, I think it'll make complete sense, um, but we're going we're gonna to work our way up to it. Uh, we've been talking about, through 1 Peter, the narrative of our journey, right? Uh, our, our going through life as a trip. And when we're on this trip, when we're on a, a trip with our children, what do they constantly say? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? So, so in this moment, right, we know like immediately parents have context for where we are in this book. What Peter is doing is he is breaking down the Christian life and he's saying, look, this is a hard journey. This is a tough road that you're going to travel. And the point is this, uh, you're going to ask that question to the Lord. Are, are we done? Are, are you ready to come back? Is, is this it? Are we there yet? And Peter patiently over and over answers that question as no, <laughs> we're not there yet. We're not there. Yes, we're there in a, in a sense that the Lord has accomplished his work, but we still have to walk through this life as long as he's called us to walk through it. The Lord's coming back, make no mistake. And all the gray hairs said, amen. <laughs> right? Lord's coming back. And, and through different life seasons, we put different focus on that, and it means different things to different people. All the youngsters are like, no, wait, I have life to live. Those of us that have a lot of children and more children on the way, we're like, even so, Lord, come quickly, come quickly. Are we there yet? No. Uh, but it's just one of those things. Wherever you are in a season of life, know that that's kind of the question that's being asked this morning. And so we're going to play off of that idea that we're on this trip, we're on this journey, and, and we're going to look into chapter 5. How many know that, like, uh, well, no, I, I, I want to just tell the illustration right now, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to save it. All right. Look at chapter 5, verse number 1. Chapter 5. I don't do well with surprises. I don't do well with, like, holding on to my illustrations for that right moment. I just want to give it all to you. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. So before he concludes this book, I love preaching through the Bible. I really do. Um, I'm excited today. I think this is the 10th book, as when I counted it last night on my Facebook. This is the 10th book of the Bible that we've preached through at Bethlehem since our church started. That's exciting. The 10th book. So we'll continue to preach the Bible and not our opinions or our topics or, you know, whatever I'm upset about this week. Chapter 5, <laughs> verse number 1. You ready? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 1. I exhort the elders among you. As a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings, the theme of the book, to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed, shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording over it those entrusted to you, but being, what's that next word? Examples to the flock, or in samples, depending on what version you have. When the chief shepherd, verse 4, appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. In the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. All of you clothe yourselves with what? Humility toward one another. And I love this. Why? Because God resists the what? The proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let's stop right there. We're going to deal with these few verses, and then we're going to go to the conclusion. Listen, this is an exhortation, verses 1 through 5. How are you doing online? I feel like the Lord just told me to speak to you. How are you doing? Are the kids running around the living room right now? Sit them down. Put, put Bluey on in the next door. No, just kidding. Whatever you got to do, let's focus in right here. So the fir first five verses here deal with specifically an exhortation to church leaders. Sometimes it's hidden beneath the surface. The Greek word presbyteros, or elder, 
uh, it is what you think it would be, like a leader of a church, and it also has the same connotation as a gray hair. So, so what, we, what we find here is that some, some would not pair this passage with other church leadership passages, but you should, contextually. So Peter turns as a church leader, right, thinking about what, what he has done uh, in this as one of the 12 disciples, and then as establishing, think about his sermon at Pentecost, establishing the church Peter is now turning, remember, this is probably A.D. 60, A.D. 70, approaching the end of his life, writing this letter through uh, probably Silvanus, pinning this, and at this moment, he turns and he exhorts and encourages the church leaders. Listen, I want to exhort and encourage you church leaders. We have elders in our church. A lot of times people say, what are elders, right? Why would we have elders? Why aren't they called pastors? Well, it's the same kind of thing. Uh, but why I chose the word elders is, guess what? It's right there, right there in the text. We really strive to be biblicists here at our church. We really strive to strip away as much tradition as we can, leave what's good, right, and, and focus in on what the Bible says. And the Bible here specifically equates a position of leadership with those that have experience, right? And before you think it's those that have experience uh, only in age, remember what Paul said to Timothy, right? In a pastoral epistle, right? He says, let no man despise thy what? Youth, but be thou an example, which is exactly what's being uh, asked of them right here. Be an example to the flock of God that is among you. So here's the thing. I pinned down just a few, a few thoughts here. What is good church leadership look like? And if it doesn't, trust me, I'm preaching to myself here. I know that this is a struggle. Uh, do you know it's hard sometimes to stay encouraged as, the, as a pastor? Do you know that? Sometimes it's discouraging, and my wife kind of, mm -hmm, she maintains her posture well. But it's, it's hard sometimes. It's discouraging sometimes. Why? Because sheep are what? <laughs> Just kidding, dumb. No. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm also a sheep in this equation. <laughs> the ripple. Oh, did he just say? Yes, he did. Uh, don't, don't leave online. The point is this. is it's, let, Ministry would be great if it wasn't for people. <laughs> it's tough. It's not easy. We have multiple personalities here, right? All different walks. But, but here's what we go back to. Calling. Calling. Why are you in a position of leadership? Trust me, I wouldn't be in this position if God had not called me. We tried to run from it. We tried to get away from it. We tried to move out of Maryland. The Lord's like, no, <laughs> stay right there. Stay right there. Why? Because it's about the flock. It's not about your location. It's about the people, not the place. So in, in, in this thought here, here's a few things that, I've, that I kind of just wrote down, what, what it spoke to me. I put this, for elders and church leaders, and if you're here online, in person, and you're aspiring to be an elder or a church leader here, we're going we're gonna to have a, a blind ballot vote at our church business meeting this year like we did a couple years ago. I'm excited about it. But here, here's what I think good looks like. You ready? When you are serving the sheep and being led and cared for by the shepherd, man. When I, when I thought about what, what Peter was saying here, what he's saying is really as an elder and a leader, as an under-shepherd, you're still a sheep. And, and, and here's what I see. Understand that when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive a crown of glory. What does that mean? We're still being shepherded. What does it look like? What, is, what does good leadership look like in churches when pastors are sheep to the shepherd of Jesus? And I, I thought about that this week. When you are serving the sheep but being led and cared for by a shepherd, men, elders, men that are leading your own homes with that headship there, understand this, that yes, you may be a leader, but you're still a sheep. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget that the Lord is still over you and leading you in, in that equation. And so therefore, we have to understand that we have to be led by Jesus too. And if at any point, and I know this happens in ministry, we've been there, where you're leading people and then you, you feel alone. And you look around and you think, am I being led by Jesus? Am I just going through the motions? That's a scary feeling as a leader. What does good look like? It looks like when we're serving the sheep and being led and cared for by the shepherd. Here's another thing. When you are not looking for a return from those you are serving, we see this right here in the text, but are leading them to a place where they will know what they should do because of your example. 
Listen to that again. When, what does good look like, leaders, those aspiring to be leaders? When we are not looking for a return, this is not transactional, but we're in turn leading you to the place where you are stewarding what the Lord gave you for the right reasons. Do you, do you understand? Do you understand what I'm saying? The difference, I've seen some church leaders in some churches become, what can you do right now for the church? What will the church do for them when they are serving in the right capacity and giving of themselves? What will that do for them and their spirit? It will flow so much better. That's kind of what I'm sensing here when he says, not an overseer out of compulsion, but willingly. The only way this works, and here's what I think Peter's getting at, the only way this works is by the grace of God. <laughs> the grace of God. And the only way the Lord is going to give that grace is if the leaders are in a place of humility. Do we not see that here in verse 6? Pride, listen to this church, pride is the catalyst for a self-centered church. Pride is a catalyst for a self-centered church. And humility is a proving ground for God's grace to move on us. Choose humility. Choose humility. If you're wondering how to start your life with the Lord, choose humility. Why? Because God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. So many people are doing this Christian life on their own. Watch this in the context of the first few verses. So many leaders are leading with their gifts and abilities instead of God's grace. I, I was just having a moment this week. I've been having a lot of moments lately where I just sit back and I cry. And I look around and I think, this is the Lord's doing. We've prayed specifically. I had a, I'm not going to embarrass him, but... There's a fella in this room right now. Last year, I fasted and prayed with his wife for him to be saved. He was not a churchgoer. And guess what? He's here today. Guess what? He's been faithful. He's been serving. I mean, me and his wife, conversations with my wife about it, and we just said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to fast and we're going to pray. Guess what? It was one of the requests for the 21 days of prayer and fasting that our church did in the beginning of the year. And guess what? The Lord has answered that prayer. I, the Lord's doing these things. Listen, we'll get a lot further in humility than we will pr with pride. Why? Because we don't want the Lord to resist what we have. We want the Lord to work in what we have. Why? Because this is his anyway. Okay, all right. That's the first few verses. I love preaching through the Bible. We're about to shift gears. Are you ready? Let's go back to our Bibles. Chapter 5. Verse number six. Let's just read six through the end to 13. Six through the end. And if you have your program, you know where I'm going. Follow along in my notes there. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time. This is a very famous verse, okay? Right? You're going to kind of know where this is headed when we read this. And this verse gets thrown around a ton. But I want to put it in context this morning. That he may exalt you in the proper time. Verse number seven, look at it with your own eyes. Here we go. Casting all your cares on him because he what? Cares about you. Casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. <laughs> be sober minded, be alert. Your adversary, the who? The devil, the accuser, is a prowler, a roaring lion. Walking around, looking for anyone that he can what? Devour. Next two words, resist him. Resist him. Say it with me. Resist him. Say it again. Resist him. Firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. Do you understand the context that this is in, this, in the framework of this scripture? He's, he's wrapping up this book, this letter, and he's concluding to the church. He's saying, do you understand that you have to deal with your suffering? You have to deal with your hardships in a specific way because if you don't, the devil is going to use them against you. That's what he's saying. 
We throw around all the time. Just cast your care on him. Listen, we have a society that is stricken with anxiety because we're not practicing what is right here in the text. I'm going to be sensitive to this topic of anxiety this morning, but that's really what we're talking about. But Peter tells us specifically how to deal with it. It's almost like he knew that it would be something that we would struggle with in the future. It's almost like he knew that this would be something that would cripple Americans. We sit in the land of opportunity, in the land of wealth, and we're paralyzed with anxiety. We will not do the things that God wants us to do with what we have because we're scared to death. Is that something that the enemy is capitalizing on? That's what it says. Firm in your faith. What I also want you to see is that your faith, your belief, your trust should fuel success over your anxiety. You see that? Resist him, firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of suffering our believing, our believing experienced by your, our being experienced uh, by your fellow believers throughout the world. We're not alone in this. Verse ten: The God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself look at this, own this, understand how powerful this is. He will. What's that next word? Restore, establish, strengthen, and support you after you have suffered a little while. To him be dominion forever. What is it? Amen. Through Sylvanus, a faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly in order to encourage you and to testify that it is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. I love this here. This is interesting. She who is in, what's that word? Babylon. She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you. This is a bookend. This is a bookend. He started the book saying, this is to the chosen living as what? Exiles. Remember the week one of the series. Chosen living as exiles. And then he's going to book into this with, hey, by the way, you people in Babylon, that's another way of saying chosen living as what? Exiles. Babylon is the picture of captivity, the picture of the world. He's saying you're running around in the devil's kingdom, tearing it down. You chosen, you saints of God, you sisters and brothers of the Most High King, you sons and daughters, you're running around in an earthly kingdom that the devil thinks he owns. You're resisting him and you're tearing down his kingdom one person at a time. Every person that is taken from the claim of sin and of death and that is transported to the kingdom of life one at a time. You are tearing down the kingdom of darkness. Hey, those of you in Babylon, don't worry. Their reign isn't going to last long. That's what he's saying. It's all right there. Chosen together. Hey, I send you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Come here, babe. Peace to all of you. Just kidding. Later. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Listen, we're going to talk about this real quick. This thing, if I could pull out one thing in this end passage and really... Press in, 1152. Man, we're doing great on time. Great. That's the first time I've ever said that. (laughs) If I could press into one thing this morning that I think is going to be really helpful, it's this thing of anxiety. Would you all agree that that's something that we're really dealing with as a nation, as a church, online? Maybe you're still home because you're dealing with this, and that's okay. I just don't want you to be crippled by it. Second Timothy, I'm going to walk you through some scriptures. Everything that I'm going to say today is in the program. I want you to take it, download it, copy it. These are verses. I, listen, listen to me, church. I get a lot of questions about anxiety. I get a lot of people in our church and, and, and around. Listen, some of you are counselors. Some of you, some of you are summer. <laughs> some are you. I really want summer. How many are ready for summer? It's coming out even when I don't want Some of you help folks. Some of you, you're the one in your family that people call. I'm going to give you, I'm going to equip you this morning with some incredible verses that speak to this thing of anxiety. Are you ready? 2 Timothy 1, 7, it says this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. Fear goes with anxiety. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but one of power 
and love and of sound judgment or of, and a sound mind. Listen, we have to start this thing of anxiety off what Peter is addressing here with, with understanding that God did not give you that spirit. God did not put that thing in you, that spirit of fear, that thing that cripples. You have to understand that that is an order of the enemy. It's not something that God put there. Maybe caution, maybe wisdom, maybe concern, but not a spirit of fear. So, so it's time that we just call it what it is. This is the enemy working in your life. We have to identify it. We have to know. Sounds like something in some creed somewhere. We have to know our what? Our enemy. Anxiety is a constant, fearful state, accompanied by a feeling of unrest, dread, or worry. The person may not be aware of what is creating the fear. Man, how many of you have experienced that? Anxiety is aroused by a number of factors. One, it's a constant state of fear. It's aroused by a number of factors. External situations. External situations. Listen, but God hath not given us a spirit of what? Fear. Keep that scripture in your mind. But anxiety is casting all your care. That Greek word is this word that we come up with anxiety. Understand that it's external situations. How many know that there are external situations that cause that inward position of fear? Know that. Physical well-being, listen, a lack of sleep, blood sugar imbalance, sometimes improper health can lead to those feelings. Your body is a temple, right? I'm speaking to the choir here, you know what I'm saying. I got that sympathy 15 for my wife because she's pregnant. I've been picking it up, sympathy 15, that's my excuse. But listen, some of that can lead to fear and anxiety. Modeling. Parents who were highly anxious, you know who you are. And then the little ones are there going, you're creating that. That can be a cause of anxiety. And here's one, one that I've been studying a little bit more recently, trauma. Situations that may be similar to experience of the past that caused great pain. You know, some of you have traumatic experiences in the past, and that's the reason for your anxiety. But, but I want you to understand, God has not given you a spirit of what? Fear. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. Look, we're talking about the trip here. We're talking about the journey. Look, on this journey, you're going to experience some anxiety. Taking trips as a kid, I used to experience them driving through the mountains, going to visit my family in Tennessee. You get in like Chattanooga, you know what I mean? In East Tennessee, where you look over and it's like, Phew. and you get that feeling in the pit of your stomach. You know what I mean? Am I the only one where I'm like, oh, we could just like, yep. just fall right over. <laughs> Even though we're not going to, but you get that feeling like that, that's caused by external things, right? We all have that in your spiritual journey. Watch, some of you have had traumatic church experiences, traumatic things where spiritually you've been hurt and harmed. And listen, you're living with that fear that it's going to happen again. But God has not given us a spirit of fear. Anxiety symptoms can include, just in case you're wondering, if you're like, I'm not an anxious person, inability to relax. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> the first one got me. I was like, man, <laughs> just because you're not like stricken with fear doesn't mean you're not struggling with anxiety. Some of you are busy, 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 busy bees because when you stop, that's when it comes. You can't be left alone. David said the psalmist, while I was musing, the fire burned. While I was thinking, while I was sitting and meditating. When was the last time you sit and meditated? Oh, I don't do that. There's a reason. If you can't sit and be still and know that I am God, then you're living in a spirit of fear. What a, what a way to wrap up First Peter. You guys are like, mm. <laughs> Inability to relax, tense feelings. Hey, honey, how was your day at work? Mm. Yeah. It's like, did the roaring lion thing, just did the shoe go on the other foot here? You've become the enemy. Mm. <laughs> Everything was great. 
Really? That's awesome. That is, I'm so glad. <laughs> Tense feelings. Rapid heartbeat. I, you know what I noticed just now? All of these are symptoms of COVID-19. I'm just saying. No, anyway. <laughs> they are. <laughs> Rapid heartbeat. <laughs> COVID is anxiety wrapped up. The devil crafted a virus that we've all been living with for years, right? Tense feelings, rapid heartbeat, dry mouth. Dry mouth. <laughs> True. Increased blood pressure, jumpiness, feeling faint, excessive perspiring. We're doing good. Feeling clammy. Constant anticipation of trouble. You think worst case. You think worst case. And many of you know who you are because your children are like, when's the bad guy coming to get us? <laughs> You're birthing it into your children. Constant worst case. Are we safe here? Mom doesn't think so. <laughs> Dad doesn't think so. It's funny, man. I, it's not funny, but you get my point. Constant feeling of uneasiness. If anybody, listen, what I'm going to give you today is just going to unlock your spirit. I hope to equip each one of you in person and online with a way to deal with your anxiety that just liberates you this morning. That you can just walk out of here and be like, today's a new day. And there is no sunshine. Just kidding. Let's go Kirk Franklin on it. Come on, let's go Kirk Franklin. <laughs> That's a good song. Hello, fear. Look it up. Isn't that good? My goodness. The three of you that know it. Come on, y'all. Get some culture. Kurt Franklin. Get some culture. The point is, is I want to unlock you in this place where you're just like, I can deal with this. Because here's the thing, I and I honestly believe this, online, in person, I just feel like we act like we don't know how to deal with it. And if there's this one thing of anxiety that just stays as something that I just cope with, listen, we're not going to be as effective in our marriages, as parents, as Christians. I don't... I don't want to take this thing lying down. I want to take it head on. How many of you are ready for the scriptures to help? You ready? Okay, here they are. You ready? Psalm 94, 19. When I am filled with cares, your comfort brings me joy. Let the word of God wash over you this morning. When you're filled with care, your comfort brings me joy. I know you're filled with some things this morning. I know you're filled with some pain. I know there's loss. I know there's trauma. I know there's things in your heart and in your life that, that are really just overflowing. But understand this, that his comfort can bring you joy. Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety in a person's heart weighs it down, but a good word cheers it up. But a good word cheers it up. I think about one of, I think it's a psalm. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. I could go for an apple of gold right now. You know what I'm saying? Lord, why don't you put one under my pillow? I'd lose a tooth for that. An apple of gold. You know, there's something that you could speak into someone this morning. <laughs> Sorry. Something that you can speak into that would be a word that would change them rather than feed their anxiety. Understand that. This is probably one of the most powerful passages for anxiety. Are you ready? Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. And I'm going to read it right here. You ready? Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life. And all God's people said, no, Jesus, no. This is what I do. If I could get paid for my anxiety, I would be as rich as you. Serious. This is what we do. We worry. We, we, we fret about things. God, you're going to sit here and tell me, don't worry. Don't be anxious. Yeah. Hey, don't worry about it. The Lord's like, why would I do, why would I plan this whole thing of redemption to take care of you for you to worry about all the things that I've already taken care of? He says this, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. That's a good one. <laughs> Isn't life more than food? I don't know, is it though? <laughs> no, anyway. Is it more than food and the body more than clothing? 
maybe Jesus, Jesus hadn't been to Michael's Cafe. <laughs> if he'd been to Michael's, he'd be like, just worry about that one restaurant, because it's really good. You know? Shout out to Michael's. You make awesome stuff. <laughs> Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father, what? Maybe we haven't stopped and considered that all the other creation on earth trust, trust their preservation to the Lord. If a bird can trust its preservation to the Lord, then why can't we, dear God? The, the Lord worries about them. He feeds them. Can any of you, verse 27, add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? In other words, what's going to happen is going to what? You can't add to your life by worrying about it, right? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wild, wild flowers, observe those wildfires. <laughs> observe how the, it's the dry mouth, that's what it is. Observe how the wild flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of these. Watch this, verse 30. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, O ye of little faith? So don't worry saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what we will wear. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. Or in other words, those that don't have Jesus are the ones seeking those things. Just pause. Intermission. Boop. It was often said to me, Christians should dress different and act different and, and do all these different things. That's how I grew up, right? Listen to me. Literally, the passage is saying the what? You're going to construct your whole framework on that? Uh, no. Really, what the Lord is saying, what Jesus is saying is the world should look at you and the difference that they should see is that you're not worried about it. It means the difference is not external, but rather where? Oh, novel idea. You mean the gospel is about an inward transformation that comes outward? Yeah! <laughs> Woo, we got it. We got it. We figured it out. I finally figured it out. That's what it is. If we become more about the clothes we wear, the things we buy, what we drive, we've missed the what? We've missed the point. Those things are not bad, but those things are not the reason. You understand? Okay, the Gentiles seek those things. People who are not of the Lord. Watch this, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, <laughs> what's it there for? The Lord says, I've got you. I got you. My pockets are deeper than what you can ever imagine. Or watch this ever achieve. In other words, the rat race of trying to have all of those things is not going to bring fulfillment. What's going to bring fulfillment is that you let the Lord steward those things. Some of you will be incredibly wealthy in this life. There's nothing wrong with that. And the Lord says, it's okay, let me steward it. Seek what? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what? All these things will be added. It's okay. Let him add, let him steward. This is for someone, th this is no class system. Do you understand what the Bible does, what the gospel does? It levels us, and it says, let the Lord steward what you have. Why? Because he's already taken care of it. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Most of our worry is wrapped around things that are already taken care of. Therefore, last one, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Isn't that the truth? Sufficient today is the evil thereof in other translations. Sufficient. Listen, let's focus on what the Lord's doing in our life. What? Right now. You ready? It's not, I'm, not, I'm not done yet. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Don't worry about anything. But in everything through what? Prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to God. What do I do about the things that I do need or that I feel like I do need right now? Just seek ye what? First, the kingdom. Present them to God. Do you think the Lord doesn't know? Remember the birds. First Peter 5, 6 through 8. Here it is. 
Now we've landed home. This is our text. You ready? Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting what? All your care on him because he cares about you. Be sober-minded. This is the B. This is what you should do. You look for the action verbs in the text that declare how we should act. We spent this whole time talking about what anxiety is. And I think if we're all honest, we all deal with it on some, some kind of level. So if the scripture, how many believe the Bible? Okay, three of you. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. If you believe the Bible, what we're going to do is we're going to do exactly what the Bible says in order to defeat or deal with our anxiety. You ready? It says B... Be sober, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walking around seeking whom he may devour. Let's find this here, right here in the. Verse number nine. Look at verse number nine. What does it say? Resist him. The devil's walking around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. What's the next two words? Resist him. I want you to say it with me. Resist him. Say it again. Resist him. That's a quick thing, isn't it? Resist him. How many know that's a quick thing? Resist him. Resist him. Let me just give you a little bit of context of, of the devil. I've been reading a lot. A lot of us have. We've been passing these books around about the unseen realm. And what de demons, demonic forces, and angels, what it kind of really looks like. And really what you find when you study this devil figure is the word just means the accuser. Diablos, this guy who brings up stuff. If you will, in a courtroom where they're prosecuting, they're reading off all of the charges. You almost get this view, stay with me, we're shutting her down, circling the wagon, stay with me here. You almost get this view that there's this divine counsel in heaven. Where, where the Lord is there listening as the supreme being to all of the charges brought before about the human being. We see this in Job, don't we? Where they were gathering, and he says, have you considered? And it's almost like, you know, the accuser or the Satan figure gets on his MacBook and pulls up the file and says, oh, I've got some accusations. So in a New Testament context, what Peter is saying is in the divine council where, let's say for, for our sake of tradition, Satan and one-third of the angels that have defected, they're bringing accusations against image bearers of Jesus. We all bear, that's, that's what makes human beings different than animals. We were made in the what? Image of God. We are image bearers. So if at any time... Satan can declare an image bearer no good, he will. He will say, here's an accusation that what? Sticks. <laughs> but what Peter is saying is because Christ has suffered and died and buried our sins and we've declared our loyalty to him, there is not one accusation that will stick. All you got to do is humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. He will lift you up. He will exalt you in due time. You see, if you're down and out, if you're in a place of trouble, if you're in a place of anxiety, if you're stricken with fear, it's because the devil is lobbing things and accusations and you're letting them stick. But let me tell you something. By the grace of God, you're the only one that's letting them stick. The Lord is looking at you and he's saying, I've already cared for that accusation. I've already paid for that sin. I've already redeemed it. You see, I died on the cross through my son. And Jesus is the answer to every accusation. Every accusation. Peter pulls up on this book and he says, listen, you can endure because Jesus endured. You can be free from all your trouble and all. Listen, just cast them on him. Why? Because he's already cared for them. Oh, 
Man, it's good when theology makes its way to our heart and we understand the scriptures and we see now that the Lord says, listen, just ca- what, what he, here's what the devil does. Here's a thought. The roaring lion figure. <laughs> I went to Africa one time, actually twice. <laughs> Remember, chief, those prides, those prides of lions. It was funny, I paid off, <laughs> probably shouldn't have done this, but I paid the driver off. We went on a safari, and I was like, we, we actually were helping start an orphanage, and I wanted to get close to the lions. And in the savannah, you're riding in an open jeepney. It's, it's open. And so the one driver was like, oh, you know, you could, they're through a translator, you know, American has money, he'll pay you to take you to see, rah, lion. And I'm like, yeah, rah. And you think I'm crazy now? I was really crazy then. I'm like, how much do you need, bro? Let's go. Let's go. So the one says, my vehicle's better than the other. (laughs) You don't want to drive your vehicle over there and get stuck. His is four-wheel drive. So, but I find out real quick, so anybody who wanted to be a part of paying this guy off to take them over to see the lions, Simon, I think is what it is, but anyone who's going to take them over to see the lions, uh, they would get in this truck and pitch in. But the guy gets in, and he couldn't get the truck started. So I'm like, what's going on? I was like, hey, 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 third pedal over there, push it in, then start. I was like, this guy can't drive a clutch. I was like, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's like, oh, okay, good. Throws it in gear and jumps us all. And I'm like, oh, no. He's like, no, we good, we good, brother, we good. So we're driving. He's like, I know where they are. I know where they are. No joke. We pull up, and there's eight of them. And, I mean, I'm saying, like, from here to the wall, he gets us close. More money, more money, shillings. So we pay him. And then I'm like, he's like, oh, pops the clutch, stalls the vehicle. Are you you got to be kidding me. This is crazy. But he's like, shh. You know, so we're, like, watching him. We're, like, right here. And guess what? Who the first ones to get upset were? Of the pride of lions. The dude, the lion that you picture in your mind, he's in the back, the man. It's the women lion I learned that you really got to watch out for. They're the hunters. They're the prowlers, and they bring it in. It's those women lion, you know what I'm saying? You got to watch out for them. The big guy, all he has is a roar. The ones who were actually carrying out, the first ones to stand and start to approach our vehicle were the female lions. And then I was like, dude, come on, get out of that chair. Get out of, I know how to drive a stick. Let me get in the driver's seat and get out of here. And he was like, boom, boom, boom. And he takes off and we drive and thank the Lord we made it out of there. But it was like two or two or three of them just starting to pace, get upset. And I think about this verse. The devil's just the big guy standing off to the side And all he has is what he can say and what he looks like. He actually doesn't do anything. You have to understand the the accusations that he makes. He's not the one you have to worry about. And I think of it this way. Fear the one who can put both body and soul into where? Hell. And that's our God. (laughs) If God be for us, who can be? No enemy can stand against the power of the Lord. So I want to give you one tool and then we're gone. This is how it works, okay? We know that the devil has no power over us. Do you know that? Easter Sunday is going to be all about our champion. So I want to give you a very practical way to deal with your anxiety today. How many want that? How many want a very practical way to deal with it? Resist him, right? Say it with me. Resist him. Resist him. Understand this. God loves you. Listen to me. God loves you and paid the highest price for you. Yeah, come on up, guys. God loves you and he paid the highest price for you, his son. I'm going to do the illustration before you guys begin to play because it will ruin your playing. Number two, God desires you to be happy. Listen, God desires you to be happy and fulfilled in his will. That's the challenge. We're off doing our own thing, and when we do our own thing, we deal with our own fears. 
but we're not going to do that anymore. Satan has paid nothing for you and wants you to be miserable. Listen to me. Satan has paid nothing for you, and he wants you to be miserable. Satan can only accuse, promote, and antagonize you to a place of fear and misery. Satan uses anxiety. Satan uses anxiety. Cast it. Here's another way of saying it. Throw it. Turn it down. Or watch this. Don't answer it. Don't answer it. Resist it. Hold on one second. Let me help you with this. We're talking, as we close this book, we've been using this travel narrative. This vehicle narrative that we get in and that we drive in. Right? The spiritual journey. How many have ever got a call about your extended warranty on your vehicle? (laughs) Turn it up, Kyle. Shh. Anybody ever heard that? Wait, do it again. Click it again, Bill. Click it again. Just click the video again. Start it over. Wait, wait, wait. Two minutes goes by. Three minutes goes by. Can you do it again? Same, same ringtone. Wait a minute. Listen, listen. Okay, put the logo up there. Or not the logo, the the verse, whatever. Listen to me. There's no shame in their game. Haven't we all dealt with this? We're continuing to deal with it? Watch. They're going to call you over and over and over. But wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. no. Stop. What do you do? Block it or what? Don't answer it or what? Hang up. You all have been conditioned. You have been conditioned to deal with, we're trying to reach you about your car's extended warranty. And if I could leave you with this one thought today, none of you need an extended warranty. Jesus is your extended warranty. He pays for it all. There's not one repair that he won't make. There's not one place that you'll pull your car up, one garage where he won't foot the bill. And the devil will call you tomorrow. He'll call you tomorrow. He'll call you tomorrow. And the next day, and the next day, and listen, I want a church that has been conditioned to hang up. All it means is what? Resist him. Resist him. Resist him. If you know how to hang up the doggone phone, then you know how to resist the devil. There's more to it than that, Pastor. You don't understand the roots of my anxiety. You don't understand the roots of the Savior's love that go deeper than any thought of anxiety that will cripple you. You will think about this. When your phone rings, it's the same as him coming to you. And you absolutely know the other person on the end of the line cannot help you. I want you to hang up the phone. Now, here's where we get serious. Here's where we get serious. You have to resist it. I know, I know, there are some in here. You've, all, you've been sitting on the doggone phone for hours with Satan. He's held you captive. You have not had the strength to hang up the phone. Listen, sometimes you need somebody to come up and just take the phone out of your hand. And that's what I'm doing this morning. Give me the phone. This is what you do for your 90-year-old grandmother that doesn't understand that it's literally someone trying to rip her off. Just what? 